Predators preying on our kids. I can't think of any bigger threat in their day-to-day -day lives. Not one. Cyber attack. At a moment's notice, your steering can lock up. This is the sort of power that a hacker has today. Fake news continues to be rapidly distributed. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything. And moving forward, we need to be more vigilant. Scientists warn no part of the world will be spared from the climate crisis. The rate of people dying from Alzheimer's disease in the United States rose by 55%. Drug-resistant infections, often called superbugs, are one of the world's most urgent health problems. Hello, and welcome to the High Tech Horror Show. My name is Josh Liggett from the Archive Investments team, and I'll be your guide here today through this deluge of despair that we've put together for you. Now, this isn't your typical horror show. Trust me, we're gonna play with your emotions and scare with you a little bit, you know? But instead of showing you things like zombies and ghosts and buckets of blood and monsters, we're gonna show you real fears that scare the ever-living hell out of you. I'm talking about organ trafficking, human trafficking, hitmen, illegal drug sales, identity theft, and that's just the dark web. These are fears that, you, that keep you up at night, or things that you don't even know about and we're gonna to bring to your eyes and are gonna really, really scare you. But don't worry, all is not lost. We're gonna show you some amazing technologies that are protecting us from these fears, and some unbelievable companies working countless hours to protect us and make sure we sleep soundly at night. Because while technology may have gotten us into this mess, it's also gonna get us out. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to start with the first fear. This first fear is something that has become such a big part of our lives, we can't imagine a world without it. Something that is so intertwined in our daily life that we're interacting with it throughout the day. Because unfortunately, our friend the internet is out to get us. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set. You're going surfing on the internet. The internet gave us a whole world of exciting new possibilities. So I guess this is a story of how it changed our lives. The uptick in online predators means the internet can be one of the scariest places for our children. As Rich told you, we installed the internet on our computer just a short time ago, and I haven't been able to get the kids off it ever since. The FBI is warning kids they may be a target of online predators pretending to be someone else. Having the internet in our home has had a great impact on our lives. Rich keeps up with the stock market and our investments, and I'm able to pay the bills in half the time it used to take me. It almost feels like we become numb to this. There's so many data breaches at big recognizable companies, the numbers just go from bad to worse. I used the World Wide Web to search the archives of the Smithsonian Museum a few weeks ago. I also had to do a homework assignment about the Wright brothers for a history assignment. The conversation surrounding misinformation online is growing. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set. You're going surfing on the internet. So I guess we thought the internet was going to change us the world in one way, but really it was something else. Back in the 90s, we thought that, you know, access to the information superhighway, getting these emails in these, uh, four emails actually, getting in the mail, you know, CDs, um, you know, we really thought that that was going to change the world, but we didn't really realize all the ramifications it would have. And if you think that's bad, that's nothing compared to the dark web. Because if this is the high-tech horror show, the dark web is the horror of horrors. The seedy underbelly of the internet features message boards and forums where you can buy whatever you want. Our friends at Sixkill, who we're gonna bring out in a minute, sent us over a few screenshots of some of the things that you can buy on the dark web. Let's see. Start with identity theft, something we all know very well. Social security numbers for sale, date of birth, everything. Fresh Visa cards, open for sale, whoever would like. 264,000 Facebook accounts at the click of a button. Any doctors in the room? Because there's 5,000 doctors, names, addresses, phone numbers, everything, available for $90. If there are any bankers in the room? 117,000 names of bankers, again, email, everything, 
for only $90. Moving to the more exotic space, we have drug sales. Check mark at the bottom this is a very good seller, just like in, uh, you know, on Amazon, you know, trusted seller, there's another trusted seller. Uh, GMT is a Schedule 1 narcotic in the US, so this is available for sale. Hitmen, gun sales, available, see at the bottom, on WAD 3, available. Getting to more esoteric things, the Mexico City Airport database for sale. Admin access to a railway system in China, open to anybody. Database to get on the grid, to have access to a power plant in Nevada, available online. And finally, taking part in a slave trade that goes on in the world. These are just a few of the millions upon millions of things that are for sale in the dark web. So it's my absolute pleasure to bring on stage Omer Carmi, VP Intelligence from Sixskill, to talk, tell us a little bit about how his company is saving us from the dark web. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Josh. So indeed, the, the dark web is full of terrors, full of dangers, and I think that one of the key issues here is that basically everyone here in this room and in other rooms here in the States, in Asia, in Europe, basically everywhere are affected. Uh, whether it's your family, your organization, your personal identification information, uh, your account on Amazon, your bank login, everything is affected. So we at Sixgill are helping our customers and basically the world to try to mitigate those threats. And we are basically in the field of cyber threat intelligence. While there are a lot, a lot of companies in this field, um, our, I would say, key um, uniqueness is that we are trying to approach a new, um, a new idea. Uh, why don't we stop hiding inside the castle of uh, our network, of our computer, and start to look on the outside? Uh, why don't we look on who are the attacker? Let's proactively uh, try to find out what is the attack, when will the attack happen, where will the attack happen. Let's try to understand what is the modus operandi of the attacker. What is the strategy? What is the tactic? What is the techniques that those attackers are, are trying and will try to use against us? Um, but that's, that's very good. But you need also to understand, um, well, what can you do in order to protect yourself? But you can do a lot of things. So you need to get um, a risk analysis or an understanding of what would be the most um, elegant and efficient way to counter it. So you need to prioritize those countermeasures. A and lastly, basically, you need to do everything very, very quickly, because I think that one of the, the more acute problems in our world is that there is simply too much information, and, and honestly, there is not enough context. Um, we think that today's world is, is very similar to, to this newspaper. This, 19th century uh, New York Times, New York Daily Times actually, newspaper, first edition. And very much like today's word, it doesn't have any context. There are probably thousands of um, typos in it because no one can really prove reading it. Um, most probably you and you are looking on very, very different things in this newspaper. And until you discover this, it would take ages. Basically, this newspaper is becoming obsolete in an hour, probably. And we believe that today's world, today's um, approach to data, to how to mitigate threats, is very much like this, um, this New York Times. So our approach is not only uh, proactive, but also automated. And basically what we are doing is we are extracting a lot, and by saying a lot, I'm, I'm talking about millions and billions of data sets per day. And we are looking on um, the most problematic areas of the, of the internet. We are looking on blogs and sites where hackers are, are lurking. We are looking on forums and markets on the dark web where, uh, as you could see, uh, you could sell basically anything. You could buy basically anything. 
and we are looking on um, the fresh and um, very, um, I would say, newly adapted uh, areas and platforms of instant messaging apps. Everyone has WhatsApp here, probably. Everyone has Facebook here, probably. Uh, hackers don't use Facebook or WhatsApp. They use Telegram. If they are of Russian origin, they would probably use uh, QQ if they are from China. So we basically extract all those kinds of information, and we are basically providing our customers and the world with an, a platform that take all those kinds of data sets, correlate it with each other, and provide um, a very quick and intuitive way to investigate those uh, data sets, a very quick way to get alerts based on the interest of you, customized to your needs and to your assets, Everything on real-time basis, of course, because I said earlier that obsolete is uh, not in our dictionary. Everything, of course, is being constructed on a very strong AI and machine learning analytics. And most importantly, everyone can use it because everyone here in this audience and outside of this hall has vulnerabilities, uh, has something that is related to their accounts, to uh, their network to these computers. So uh, with that in mind, thank you very much and feel uh, more than welcome to um, visit us and try to understand your vulnerabilities and how we can help you to mitigate them. Thank you. Thank you, Omer. Before our next fear, quick audience questionnaire. How many of you have bought something, raise of hands, how many of you have bought something on the internet? So you didn't buy, you've never bought on Amazon.com? No orders on Amazon, okay, fine. Wanna make sure. How many of you have used the internet for financial services, banking, anything, investing, anything like that? Our crowd investors, come on, everyone raise their hands. How many of you have stored any type of information online, emails, cloud storage, anything like that? So, okay. So if quantum computers get on the loose, all that information is not secure anymore. Because without getting too technical, quantum computers tear apart the very fabric of internet security. And if we're not ready for the quantum threat, all of our information and all of our data is gonna be wide open for the taking. To tell us a little bit more about how they're protecting us from the quantum threat, I'd like to bring on Carmi Bogat, VP Marketing BizDev from QuantLR, Carmi. Wow. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the, the introduction and um, the speaker before me who talked about the dark web. We're going to talk about something called encryption. Basically, every single thing that we send on the internet or that we use is protected by encryption. And encryption is protected by math today. 40-year-old math invented by Professor Adi Shamir in Weizmann Institute, and it's expiring. As he said, quantum computers take that math and rip it to shreds. So every single piece of information on the internet will be vulnerable. Encryption will go away. There will be no way of doing it because the basic math, the fundamental foundation for protecting the internet is going to disappear. And just like you don't bring a knife to a gunfight, if you want to fight quantum computers, you need quantum technology. Quantelar is a Jerusalem-based company in the first, and we have a method for called quantum cryptography, which replaces the math with quantum physics. The only thing worse than losing your information is me explaining quantum physics to you here. I'm not going to do that. If you want to, come see us at our booth. We have world-renowned quantum physicists who can tell you about it. Just a real, real, real general thing. We use a principle called superposition which means that information can be both a zero and a one at the same time. And if you don't understand that, there's a cat owned by a guy called Schrodinger that you can go meet and he can explain it to you. So our mission is to enable world's lowest cost quantum cryptography. And you might hear quantum cryptography and you might think, wow, that sounds expensive. And actually, today it is expensive, up until QuantLR. QuantLR provides the same level of ultimately secure quantum cryptography, quantum cryptography, I have to say that fast, at about 10% of the cost of other vendors, and we do that with experts. 
This is our team. Again, I'm not going to introduce everybody. Just I'll focus on, on the Professor Chagai Eisenberg, who is a world-renowned quantum physicist, and Dr. Nitzan Livne, who is um, our CTO, also a doctor in physics. I um, am ex-NDS, for anybody who's ever heard about that company. I've sold crypto for many, many years. And together, we're the team that is going to protect the internet against quantum computers. Um, I talked about this before. RSA is the security that we all use. And actually, if for the crypto readies in the room who want to use elliptic curve and Diffie-Hellman, I didn't curse you just now, they also die with quantum computers. Math is, is dying. The only thing to use is physics. Quantum key distribution does not use an algorithm. It actually sends photons across a network in order to create a key. And it is the other real cool thing about it is digital information, when somebody takes it and looks at it, they copy it. The sender and the receiver don't know about it because digital information can be copied a million times. Quantum information, the minute you look at it, you change it. And again, don't ask me why. It's just a fact. The minute you look at it, you change it. So an eavesdropper or somebody even attempting to look at the data line will be detected and we can protect against it. Um, eventually, for all the people who want to invest, Eventually, every single link of fiber in the world, today protected with RSA, which, by the way, is every single link of fiber in the world, will take the RSA, throw it out, and put in quantum key distribution, because the RSA will be worthless. Initially, the uh, initial providers will be the people with the most sensitive information, which is your government, your health, your finance, your data centers. Um, I have news for the people here. The cloud is not in the cloud. It's actually on the ground and it sends data all day between different sites, and it contains lots of data that needs to be protected. And critical infrastructure showed up in the other scene. Um, this can also be used for authentication. So with RSA goes in, anybody will be able to turn on and off power sites and distribute trains and stuff like that. So again, you need quantum key distribution to stop that nightmare from happening. Um, there are very few companies in the world that can do this. Uh, one of the reasons is there are not too many quantum physicists. Well, there are more and more coming. Uh, Google estimates that there are 800 quantum physicists in the world. And just to give you an estimate, most of you might have seen that Google announced quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy means that you can do something in 200 seconds that would take a normal computer 10,000 years. And that's what we do. We protect the future by changing you from mathematical protection to quantum protection, please come see us at our booth. Uh, one more thing before I go, I must thank our crowd for this uh, meeting, and I want to thank John for the socks. Thank you. Thank you so much. For our next fear, it's pretty easy to understand, because what we're spending millions and billions and even trillions of dollars on infrastructure, on smart cities, on transportation, unfortunately, the world is not safe anymore. I mean, you just gotta look out your window, honestly, because the natural disasters out in the world are pretty crazy. We have fires, hurricanes, floods, tsunami, snowstorms. The list goes on and on and on. And yeah, we've seen movies or futurists talk about satellites all over the world preventing climate change at the, or natural disasters also at the click of a button. What about now? What about today? What about recovery or helping to mitigate natural disasters? Now there's some amazing technologies out there working on this and providing a solution. But one company that's really been on the forefront is Edgybees. And for some time now, Edgybees has been helping with search and rescue, with prevention. They've done amazing work in floods, helping search and rescue people get to where they need to go. And they also, over this past few months, were down in Australia helping to prevent and to help with um, everything that's going on with the forest fires down in Australia. It's my pleasure to bring on Adam Kaplan, CEO of Edgybees, to tell us a little bit more about what they're working on. That's not us. <laughs> One second. 
Second. Great, so um, we've all seen pictures like this. Uh, actually, this is, we've got Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Harvey. You're a drone pilot, you're an airplane pilot, you're looking at a picture like this and you see a bunch of water and you see the tops of houses. What you don't see is the data. You don't see that the people that are trapped in the houses, you can't see what street that is. And actually we were looking at Hurricane Harvey where they actually had scuba divers that were diving below the water to find the streets to give the access and get wor working with walkie-talkies to, to take all that information back. So what EDGBs does is take all of those data, all that information, and we fuse the data with the real-time imagery. So you look at a video like this, and this could be in China, this could be in, uh, in India, in Texas. Um, so what does EDGBs do? In terms of Hurricane Irma, that was our first sort of foray, and we actually started off as a gaming company. Uh, and we took our technology and pivoted towards this direction in a number of different places. What we did during the hurricanes is we overlaid the street names on top of the flooded streets. We actually put the information as to where people were trapped in the buildings, and we pushed that data, gave that data to the drone pilots, to the, uh, to the airplane pilots, as well as the people on the ground so they could make real-time decisions to understand what they were doing. So this technology was being used uh, in Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Michael, it's being used in a number of uh, the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, and I just got back, I was in Sydney 10 days ago, where there have been fires in New South Wales. Just a few statistics of New South Wales. There have been 5.3 million hectares that have been burnt, the equivalent of 1.3 million acres. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of destruction. And what does EGBs do in those scenarios? They have drones flying and they have helicopters flying. And what we do is, on the front lines of these fires, we're placing the data to understand what you're looking at, to give that understanding to those people, uh, what they're, you know, to make those real-time decisions. So these green and red dots, just to give you a little bit of uh, understanding, those red dots actually are fires that are happening now. The green ones were fires and they're out. The yellow ones are partial. They also use this for different types of, uh, for different types of communication to understand um, where a burnt building is, and, and all this information is being taken from the ground and then pushed back to the command centers back in Sydney. Um, there's some additional work that this is actually happening real time on the ground in Sydney, as well as uh, some other places uh, in Australia. Um, what we do here is we take all this data, and this is being pushed back to the command centers, and they bring it back to the map. You can see this is from the New South Wales, Australia. And they bring that information and show you um, where this is, and then they are able to determine where they're going to send the people, what they're going to do with all this information. Additional sort of futuristic things that we're working on is the ability to take, understand where are small fires, and then to make it more preventative. Right now, we're sort of in reactive mode, but we have some additional projects where we can use a combination of artificial intelligence and geo-registering the data to allow people, when you have a small fire, to quickly send people towards that. So that's what we're doing in, in these cases, and we have numerous examples where you look at scenarios like this, and we take the information and we put this on top of uh, all these videos. So these are some of the different types of scenarios, and I'll, I'll skip through because we've got lots and lots of cool videos that we can show you, about the ability to take that real-time data and fuse it on, on these videos. So the consumer of this information can be a pilot, it could be a person on the ground, it could be someone in a command center. So the ability to take that data, fuse it all into one, is where, where we focus on. So we focus, our company, um, we, we've done emergency, uh, defense, industrial. We actually even did the PGA tour um, and have done a number of different uh, um, uh, types of use cases. But we're very happy to help in these emergency situations and see what additional use cases that we can come up with. So. Um, in terms of other scenarios, and I'll skip over because we only have a short amount of time, is um, Josh was talking about radar. So this is, uh, I, I kind of previewed it here, but uh, radar. Here you look at an image like this. This is something called synthetic aperture radar, which is the ability for radar to give imaging from the sky. I don't know about you, but I don't know what the heck I'm looking at here. 
but this is, uh, this is the way that radar gives you the imaging if there's cloud coverage or if there's other types of uh, rain so you don't have a full motion video. So what we do is take that radar uh, information and we fuse the data right on top of that to allow people to make those real types of decisions. So once again, companies growing fast, show you the most cool thing that we've done, which is actually besides the fun stuff is a little bit what we did during the PGA tournament, which is the ability to take the golf balls and show you uh, where we are able to, in real time imaging, to take that information and track and make golf a little bit more fun. Um, but this is, these are the types of technology we've got out and running, and we're uh, happy to be a part here, and thank you for our crowd for inviting us. Thank you, Adam. I do think another fear, personally, as a golfer, another fear is having somebody watch my golf shot <laughs> no, on stage, so I'm, I'm happy for that. For our next fear, it's a little different. We talked about two global ideas. The internet, it's global everywhere, climate change, natural disasters, something affecting the world. Now we're gonna go down a little more personal and think about individuals. And it has to do with us losing our grip with reality. And that is the fact that the reality is we're losing our minds. Mental health is an issue that many people have been talking about in the past, but one word that scares everybody, myself included, is Alzheimer's. And that word strikes fear in everybody's heart. It's something emotional, it's something that touches everybody. Because, but in this case, we've shown pictures, we've shown videos, now numbers speak the loudest. Behind me, you'll see a bunch of statistics about Alzheimer's, like how one in three uh, seniors in the United States dies with either Alzheimer's or dementia. But what's most important is to note that for every number, for every dollar that's spent of the billions and soon to be trillions of dollars to take care of people with Alzheimer's, is an individual, is a person. And it's something that, like I said, touches me and worries me constantly. And that's, will Alzheimer's affect me or someone I love? Will us, my father, mother, wife, be somebody who, you know, has to go through Alzheimer's. What about a person themselves, the individual, getting that phone call, knowing that soon this may happen to me, that I may not recognize my spouse, my wife, my husband, my children, my grandchildren, the fact that my golden years of life are gone. When I'm supposed to sit back and relax, enjoy everything, I may not be able to fully enjoy that. While there isn't a cure, Tremendous strides have been taking place. A company called Insight Tech, which you saw at the main plenary, talking about tremors, is now working on clinical trials in the United States for a treatment for Alzheimer's. We put together a short video showing you the current work that they're doing there. Please take a look. David Shore is one of the first in the country to undergo a new procedure for early stage Alzheimer's disease. Doctors used focused ultrasound to open David's blood-brain barrier, a layer of cells that protects the brain from infections in the blood. This barrier also makes it nearly impossible to deliver therapeutics that treat neurodegenerative diseases. The clinical trial tests a non-invasive procedure that uses MRI imaging to target the area of the brain responsible for memory and cognition, where Alzheimer's patients have a buildup of toxic protein called amyloid. Ultrasound waves are delivered through thousands of elements and a helmet-like device. The wave pulses cause microscopic bubbles to expand and contract. First treatment, David. Here we go. Researchers predict that simply opening this barrier may help clear amyloid from the brain. This area has high amyloid. So we'll be opening this area. But it may also help doctors deliver medications straight to the site of the disease in the future, something David and Kim hope will lead to new and effective treatment. We're hopeful that it, it can help him, but we also know maybe it'll help somebody else. So while things are still very early, you know, this provides us with a little bit of hope. Because three years ago, there was no cure to tremors, and Insight Tech made that dream a reality. So we're hoping that maybe, just maybe, three years from now, we'll be able to come out here back at Summit and find a treatment for Alzheimer's. And that's something we're all hoping for. And last but not least, our final fear. This is something that I know for a fact we're all dealing with. 
I'm dealing with it, we're all dealing with it. It's something that has become a very, very large part of our lives. And we're all definitely afraid of it, because we can feel it. Because we're all afraid that superbugs will wipe out humanity. Now, unless you've been living under a rock for the past five years, five months, you know, you've seen and, been, and you can see the fear and all the problems and all the terror around superbugs and how it affects people, companies, countries, the whole world. And it's something that you can feel it and it's pal palpable of how much superbugs worry, every worry everybody. But fortunately, we have some of the most brightest minds in the world working on combating this massive problem. It's my absolute honor and privilege to invite on stage Professor Farid Murad, the 1998 Nobel Prize winner in Physiology and Medicine, and Dr. Gilly Regev, CEO of Sanitize. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Microorganisms are very clever. They replicate quite rapidly and they adapt to their environment. Viruses need intact cells to reproduce, to use the machinery of that cell. And as the environment changes with exposure to antibiotics to kill them, they adapt and survive and they become resistant. Antibiotics are used so freely now by the farmers with chickens and pigs and cows and even in patients. And we develop these superbugs they're resistant to all of our present antibiotics. Because they mutate and adapt so quickly, the industry is not paying as much attention to antibiotics as they had in the past because the cycle, life cycle of those drugs don't last very long when another superbug comes along and they've got to become resistant and we have to get new drugs. I am interested in how cells talk to each other. How do they communicate? How do they adapt to their environment? And we call this cell signaling or messenger uh, systems. And if I could have the first slide here. There are numerous mutated organisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and they're resistant to most of our antibiotics these days. And they stop responding to kill the cells. There are thousands of new patient, of patients dying from these super infections. This is how cells talk to each other, and this is what I've been doing for a living for the past 50 or 60 years. Cells create messengers. It's like an internet system in your body. Here is a population of three different cell types that are gonna to talk to each other. If cell type one is a neural cell, the messenger is called a neurotransmitter. If it's an endocrine cell, we call it a hormone. If it's a macrophage or a blood cell or a lymphocyte, we call them growth factors, cytokines, chemokines. They're released and they go find their target. And in the target cell, in the membrane, is a protein that we call a receptor. And the messenger recognizes the receptor and detaches in a three-dimensional conformational fit like a key in a lock. And turns on the biochemistry to produce an intracellular second messenger. And while there are dozens and dozens of these first messengers, there are a modest number of intracellular second messengers, only five or six. And many of these messengers have received Nobel Prizes. It's been estimated some years ago that 40 or 50% of all the drugs in the US market, excluding antibiotics and vaccines, came from cell signaling pathways. They either mimic the pathway or block it. Some of these substances can come out of the cell, such as nitric oxide. It can go back in again, or it can regulate the biology of an adjacent cell, or it can travel through the bloodstream and be released at a distant site. Nitric oxide is a rather unique molecule as a messenger. It's a free radical and a gas. I'm not going to cover all the biochemistry, uh, but I want to tell you how it can be applied to medicine and biology. 
patients with hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, tobacco use, and perhaps obesity have blood vessels that don't make enough nitric oxide. And by understanding these pathways and biochemistry, we can figure out ways to treat these patients with either drugs or nutritional supplements, and there are a variety of ways to do it. And with 160,000 publications of nitric oxide since our discovery in 1977, I'm gonna summarize where it's going. It's involved in tissue transplantation. There are some infections in gram-negative organisms that produce endotoxin that enhance the production of nitric oxide, vasodilation, and blood pressure drops, they go into septic shock. It inhibits the aggregation of platelets. It regulates the secretion of hormones from the pituitary. It regulates the release of insulin from your pancreas. It regulates genes. It influences stem cell proliferation differentiation, and it even regulates cancer cell proliferation and metastases. It does a lot of interesting things, and you can incorporate this molecule as a new approach to treat infections. It has antifungal properties, antiviral no properties, antibacterial. No it's a vasodilator as it plays a role in hypertension and blood flow. It can regulate wound healing. It regulates cytokines and chemokines and lymphocytes talking to each other. And my colleague, Dr. Jilly Reglev, is going to tell you more about its antibacterial, anti-infectious properties. Jilly. So let me take you one, back, one minute back to the, the problem. By 2050, there will be 10 million people every year dying from antimicrobial resistance. How can nitric oxide help? So nitric oxide kills bacteria, viruses, fungus, drug resistance bacteria, all of them. Sanitize has developed a formulation that can be delivered as a, as, a, as a nasal spray, a liquid, a gel, a cream that can kill all these bugs. And I'll show you a few little samples and promise not to get too much into the science. Take bacteria, drug resistant, three types of drug resistant bacteria within five to 10 minutes, complete kill from a very high concentration of bacteria to zero very fast acting. It's all depending on the dose. Get the higher we go with the dose, the faster we can kill the bacteria. And this was all done in the lab, but we've also done that in clinical and in the clinical setting in a wound model that I'm showing here. Infected wounds with lots of different types of bacteria, all of them about three log reduction within seven and a half hours, which is an amazing result in a clinical setting. And just so you can believe me and see how it works, I cannot show you how I kill the bacteria that you all have on your hands right now. But what I can show you is how we do this in the lab. And I'll show a short video where we put the bacteria in a plate, we take a hand, we dip it in a high concentration of bacteria, and we put it on a petri dish, which is how bacteria grow. Did it with a hand sanitizer, your positive control, you're all using hand sanitizers these days all the time. And then we repeated it with our nitric oxide releasing gel and with our nasal spray, the nitric oxide releasing liquid. show here the four plates, the positive control, we expect nothing to grow, the negative control, lots of bacteria. And if you look at the two plates with our treatment, just a few seconds of rubbing your hands and it's all gone, nothing. So the other thing is, other big threat we're talking about these days, I don't have to say much about it, is the pandemic. Interestingly, the WHO on January 13 this year said countries invest heavily 
in protecting their people from terrorist attack, but not against the attack of a virus, which could be far more deadly and far more damaging economically and socially. So how do we deal with that? This is, again, lab experiments where we show how we take influenza, H1N1, different types of influenza, and we get complete kill within minutes with just the liquid, the nasal spray that we're using. This is an animal model. We put viruses into cows' noses, and the two on the right are controls, all the rest are treatments. No virus was found in the nasal passages of the cows. Unfortunately, I cannot really show you how I get rid of influenza with a photo in human, but what I can show you is warts. It's human papillomavirus, warts caused by a virus. And you can see it's a 12-year-old girl with a lot of warts all over her feet, tried everything and nothing worked. We did a few of our foot bath treatment, and within a month, it was all gone. The pain actually went away within 24 hours. So we're hoping that nitric oxide is the future in treating all kinds of different infections. And Josh, maybe you want to come and try. Do I have to take my shoes off? No, you don't. I promise not to give you a foot bath. So, <laughs> but I can give you a nasal spray. So you're telling me if and I... And I can give you a gel to rub on your hands, which is much better than the alcohol that you do. So you're telling me that if I use the nasal spray, if I use that, I could... Basically, I won't, I'll be protected from H1N1 and other pandemics are going out there. Yes. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> so you rub this on your hands. Unlike the disinfectant that you're all using all the time, more, 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 more. Thank you. <laughs> this <laughs> is based on a natural molecule that we all have in the body. It's no alcohol, no... Well, you can use this on your nose. <laughs> Josh, if you spill too much, it works like Viagra. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he said if, it's, if I put too much on, it works like Viagra, so... <laughs> Which is nitric oxide is the be, active ingredient. I'll be sure to call my doctor if <laughs> four hours, you know, not a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Keeping this for later. I'm happy we ended a little bit of on a, on a happy note, on an up note. But uh, again, thank you so much for all being here. That's the end of our horror show. Um, I really want to, before we end, I hope that we accomplish a couple different things. I hope that we scared you a little bit. I hope that, uh, you know, we had give you something to think about at night, uh, you know, keep you up a little bit, and I hope that you had a good time and that you're not as scared as before. So thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.